Um, our next speaker today is Hoi Feng Poon, who is the Senior Director of Biomedical NLP at Microsoft Research and an affiliated professor at the University of Washington Medical School. He leads Project Hanover, focused on structured medical data and pre for precision medicine. And he's won numerous awards for his work, including a Best Paper Awards at NACL, EMNLP, and UAI. Hoi Feng, go ahead. Uh, can't hear you. Great. Um, sorry, trying to find the mute button. It's very different than Teams. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can everybody hear me? Yep. Great. Awesome. Um, thanks, Kyle, for the kind introduction. Uh, and really, I want to thank all the organizers for uh, the SCI NLP. Uh, this is a very exciting and uh, meaningful topic. Um, and um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, also, let me try to see if I can share, start my video so that you guys can. Okay, can you guys see me? Okay, um, yep. so great. So so today I would like to uh, chat, uh, share a little bit about our latest work on uh, applying machine reading uh, to precision medicine uh, at Microsoft. And so, I will start by uh, actually introducing uh, precision medicine and uh, actually explaining a little bit uh, what, what's all the fuss about this uh, really exciting field. Um, more importantly for this crowd, I guess, is that um, I also explain a little bit uh, why NLP, uh, especially machine reading, can potentially play a key role uh, in this uh, firing field. Um, of course, there are lots of, you know, uh, really serious uh, machine learning challenges. Uh, many of them are actually quite different from the mainstream NLP, focusing on uh, Newswire or the web. Um, so I will uh, cover some of the uh, latest progress on two exciting frontier. Uh, one is like, how can we use uh, self-supervision to address the annotation bottleneck in supervised learning? Uh, and also developing sort of novel neural architecture to address uh, some of the really complex uh, linguistic phenomenon in biomedicine. Um, I will finally, I will conclude uh, on sort of like uh, this mission about uh, structuring all the medical data and some of the uh, very uh, impactful uh, application scenarios. Um, so in the, in the ideal world, right, um, you want every patient um, to be able to respond to the treatment they're given, right? So uh, as signified by the blue person on the left, uh, as you can see here under each drug, right? Um, in the real world, in the reality, unfortunately, right? Most of the patient actually don't respond uh, to the treatment they are prescribed. So obviously, so this is a very bad situation we are in, right? Um, I mean, obviously you will ask like, I mean, doctors are all really smart bunch, right? How can they let this kind of thing happen? Now, the, from the machine learning point of view, actually this can be understood as basically a classic underfitting scenario, right? So let's take cancer as an example. Um, cancer traditionally had been uh, sort of classified very cruelly, right? So for example, you said, okay, where does the where is the originated organ, right? Is it lung or the blood? Um, you take the cell under the microscope, look at the shape, right? You maybe do a CT scan, see how big the cancers are, where are they, and so forth. So you just, you only have a few sort of very coarse feature and that make it very difficult to um, sort of, uh, actually sort of like classifying, separating the, the blue uh, uh, from the red, right? So what, what's really exciting uh, nowadays is that um, the event of the big data in, in biomedicine, right? So again, uh, cancer is really sort of like the poster trial uh, uh, in, in, in this. Um, if you uh, actually pay attention to sort of the, the sequencing, uh, the genome sequencing world, right? You will notice that the cost uh, for sequencing a human genome actually really drop faster than the Moore's law. Um, so six years ago, for the first time, it dropped below a thousand bucks, and now it's approaching hundred bucks, right? So, and from cancer biology, we know that tumor is primarily driven by uh, all those uh, mutations. So when you have the tumor uh, genome sequence, you are literally staring at uh, really the source code for the cancer, and you can potentially sort of like distinguish uh, those uh, patients down to the individual level, right? 
Uh, another really sort of like exciting, but probably everybody already taken it for granted by now disruption uh, is uh, the digitization of the medical record, uh, electronic medical records, right? So this actually only happened in the past decade, uh, uh, starting in, in the US, right? Um, so, so all these sort of advances basically keep, uh, open up uh, this enormous opportunity that we can actually uh, do developing more precise med med uh, medicine for patients. Um, but they also present sort of like a classic sort of like challenges. Um, and uh, actually it's great to start after Doug, uh, who already talked about this sort of information overload, right? So to make our uh, situation concrete, uh, let's take uh, a look at uh, a key scenario in molecular tumor board, right? So every year in the US, there are close to 2 million new cancer uh, patients every, every year. Um, and big cancer center like Memorial Sloan already start sequencing uh, pretty much everybody. Um, however, um, those sequences uh, are useless unless you can turn those uh, gene and mutation uh, into actionable sort of like uh, uh, decision making, right? So uh, which treatment regimen can be applied to uh, this patient, right? Given those uh, hundreds of mutations, right? So right now the cancer center basically organized this kind of tumor board with, uh, uh, you know, as you can see uh, a bunch of specialists in the war room, you know, looking at this 500 mutation, let's figure out what do we know about them, right? So what does the gene do? What does the mutation do? Uh, it, is there any drug that could uh, uh, be, be applicable to the cancer or does the mutation confer resistance to a particular treatment, right? Um, so right now, all this process um, to figure out those information is completely manual, uh, which is obviously not scalable. So that has been motivated us uh, at Microsoft to sort of pursue this uh, project handover where our sort of like motivation is trying to develop machine reading technology so that we can really unlock those uh, valuable structural information from the text, right, to help uh, potentially uh, decision making in clinical care and clinical research. So, for example, a paper may start by saying that, uh, you know, we're looking at a patient cohort with this particular gene and mutation, right? And then later on, it conclude that, well, uh, when we give this patient uh, this uh, drug afetinib, uh, they show partial response. So from this kind of paragraph, you might want to extract the fact that uh, if a tumor have this kind of gene mutation, right, then uh, this drug may be potentially applicable. So, so obviously that's uh, really valuable for, you know, tumor board uh, members, right? Um, so, the first challenge obviously um, uh, uh, is like, there are so many papers so like published, right? So every minute I'm talking here, there are two new paper in PubMed. Uh, it's kind of like imagining you have to read like, you know, 20 uh, AKBC proceeding every day, right? So, so that, that, that would take a lot of hours. Um, more, more where the information in the literature is actually really just the tip of the iceberg. Right, so there are um, a lot more sort of information actually scattered inside the electronic micro record, which uh, uh, there are lots of lots of text uh, out there. And so from the literature, what we would like is to be able to extract this sort of like PubMap scale knowledge graph, right? And from the electronic medical record, well, what we want is to be able to extract all this longitudinal patient journey from diagnosis to treatment to outcome, right? So there is this a new sort of emerging buzzword called real world evidence or RWE, right? So next time if you run into an executive from, you know, healthcare providers or from a true company, try to put NLP and RWE in the same sentence and, and see how they react, right? Um, so hopefully by now I sort of like convince you that there was some pretty exciting opportunities for uh, NLP and expression machine reading uh, in precision medicine. But obviously um, it's, it's not uh, uh, entirely easy to actually materialize that potential, right? The first problem obviously uh, we are very familiar with is that um, the different uh, sort of like, uh, you can easily say the same thing uh, in different ways, right? So for example, here are just a few ways to say that this tumor suppressor P53 can inhibit the apoptosis pathway uh, BCL2, right? Um, in a very small corpus, uh, you tally the words that are used to uh, signify this kind of negative regulation, you already see an extremely long tail. On the flip side, 
Um, the same expression can also mean completely different things, right? So the first amusing thing I find out in PubMed is that there is actually a gene called PDF, right? Although most of the mention of PDF in PubMed doesn't mean that, uh, this meaning, right? So you need to, your machine reader need to basically uh, figure uh, out whether the PDF is a gene or not. So by now, all these are just like bread and butter NLP challenges, right? So obviously in mainstream uh, uh, domains, we also have to tackle this. Now, in bio, when we go to biomedicine, we also realize that there are actually some additional challenges, right? That are sort of like underexplored in the mainstream NLP. So the first thing is like, when, when if you look at the newswire or the web domain, right? So a lot of the information you care about there um, oftentimes there is lots of redundancy. If you care about, you know, for example, Tom Cruise's marriage, right, there may be some convoluted passages talking about that, but chances are there may be thousands of sentences just say Tom Cruise's marriage bar. So to get those kind of information, you can actually afford to focus on relatively simple cases, like for example, uh, binary relation extraction from single sentences, right? Um, in biomedicine, unfortunately, A, the relation that we care about tend to be more and more, uh, actually much more complex, like for example, the drug gene mutation, as you see earlier, but you can also easily uh, ask about what, what about the cancer type, you know, what about the experiment type and so forth, right? And also the redundancy the, for the most valuable information is basically minimal, right? So those are the, like, the latest finding in maybe last week's New England Journal of Medicine about maybe COVID vaccines or something, right? If you miss that fact, then you, you miss it altogether, right? And, and it could be a life and death uh, thing for a patient, right? So, and when you look at those kind of mention, complex relation mention, chances are those entity could scatter very far apart in the document, right? So you can't easily just run a simple, run a bur or LSTM through, you know, uh, para, uh, over many, many paragraphs, right? So, so we need to figure out a different way to deal with this kind of challenging scenario. Um, many of those valuable facts also are wrapped in very complex semantics, right? So for example, this paragraph starts by saying, I want to understand how the resistant mechanism for this drug works, right? So I basically do artificial selection, right? Keep applying the drug to the cell line and figure out the resistant clone. And then I sequence it. I find out this new mutation that doesn't appear in normal cell lines. Um, and then I confirm that uh, this uh, mutation in B is the driver. Right, so, so after all this uh, uh, statement, right, then you can conclude that if the tumor have this mutation, then it might, uh, uh, you, you should be aware that, that it will be resistant to this drug, right? So now obviously we do have very powerful um, sort of like machine learning toolkits, right? Especially like neural networks and, and, and other latest uh, uh, goodies, um, but, most of them, the standard paradigm really sort of require lots of, you know, uh, uh, training label examples. And in Newswire, again, in the mainstream domain, uh, you have a very powerful tool of crowdsourcing, right? So you can ask the character to create, you know, a squad, you know, uh, um, um, uh, image nets and so forth, right? But in biomedicine, that tool, um, uh, uh, become very uh, hard to apply, right? So imagining asking a Turker to annotate a cancer genetic paper for you or, or, or interpret the CT scan. So, so that sort of really lead us to start focusing most of our attention on figuring out how can we operate when we couldn't actually get a lot of the label example, right? And so that leads us to this uh, really exciting sort of new learning paradigm uh, of su uh, cell supervision. Um, if you look at the standard supervised learning, um, you basically said, okay, let's uh, 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 ask to the uh, experts to create lots of this example input output uh, pairs, right? And then we can fit to well-known algorithms um, and produce the, the, the N uh, uh, models, right? So the label data become the, the fundamental bottleneck in this paradigm. Um, if we don't have a whole lot of label data, obviously there is no metric in the world. We have to compensate for, for, for that. Um, there are actually a couple resources that are sort of like free lunch, 
out there, right? So one is obviously the unlabeled data. Um, we do have lots of them, right? So, um, and also because the state is so high in biomedicine, so we tend to have actually a lot of this kind of sort of like structural resources like ontologies and so forth, right? And so, so then the key question is that can we uh, basically using those structural resource like the domain knowledge to essentially hallucinate noisy training data on the unlabeled text, right? Uh, and thereby creating uh, a lot of this uh, noisy example at scale. And so using that to bootstrap our NLP algorithms. So um, we have applied this uh, uh, approach uh, first uh, uh, on some of the fundamental biology topics, for example, the gene regulation, as you've seen earlier. Uh, and more recently, we have been focusing more on the translational side on, for example, like molecular tumor bores and so forth. And so uh, one of the simplest kind of cell supervision, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, is uh, distance supervision, right? So for any sort of like really uh, valuable things, right? Um, chances are people actually start by uh, manually trying to curate them, right? So for example, once upon a time, the National Cancer Institute mobilized the uh, Nature Publishing Group editors um, to say, well, you guys basically reading paper all day, right? Can you help us curate uh, this kind of important gene regulation uh, knowledge, right? Um, so amazingly, those editors comply and they actually created this uh, very high quality knowledge base, right? So each row basically is one of those facts, right? Um, the, um, but unfortunately, after two years, uh, the editor quit, right? It's, it's, it's too time consuming to... to um, so in biomedicine, there are literally hundreds of this kind of knowledge base, right? You've got a grant, you start a couple, uh, spend a couple years curating the knowledge base, you run out of grant money, so you stop. The knowledge base has sparse coverage and quickly run out of date, right? So, so that's really unfortunate, but we might be able to actually leveraging all those in database to actually turn them into a really productive use, right? So the idea, obviously, if you just know a fact about two genes, right, two entity, uh, it, it, it doesn't directly give you a label example, but if you then look at the unlabeled text, which you do have tons of them, and then you find out that um, those entities that you know they have a relation that you care about, right, uh, happen to actually co-occur nearby, right? Then what you can do is that you essentially take a leap of faith to say, okay, I, I will pretend that this is actually a mention that talking about this relation, right? So, so, and in this way, you essentially using a knowledge base to annotate tons of tons of noisy example, and then you can start to bootstrap your machine reader, right? Now, obviously, you know, uh, um, some of you might object that like there, there were obviously lots of, you know, uh, noise in here, right? There are a million other reasons why the two entities might occur nearby. Um, but the beauty first is that in statistical learning, it has this built-in robustness, right? That you can, uh, as long as the signal outweighs the noise, you can uh, start making progress, right? But also, you don't have to stop here. You can actually incorporate additional domain and linguistic knowledge to help uh, denoising de the, the, those noisy examples, right? So for example, um, looking at our friends of PDF, right? You have four PDF mentioned here and you have no idea each one of them, whether they are gene mentioned or not, right? Um, however, you, by observing that these are identical mentioned in nearby text, you can first conclude that they are probably co-referenced, which means that you now reduce the four uncertain decision into a single uh, uncertain decision, right? You still don't know whether it's a gene or not, but, but that's some progress. Secondly, you can also leverage another sort of linguistic phenomenon called apposition. If you're a good author, you usually define the acronym first, right? So you can easily recognize this pattern. Um, and from that, you can actually figure out that peptide deformulates probably mean the same as the PDF in the parentheses, right? So, and then the, the third piece of, uh, uh, of the general knowledge you can leverage is uh, actually the, those uh, domain knowledge I mentioned earlier, right? So um, uh, you can actually look up uh, uh, for all 20,000 human genes, right? You can actually look up 
there is a full list of their names uh, uh, and the, their standard symbols and all their names, right? Um, and you can find that peptide deformase is actually one of the aliases for the PDF gene. And unlike the PDF, right, peptide deformase is much longer, much less uh, ambiguous, right? So you're much more confident that uh, uh, this is actually what uh, it, it means, right? So when you combine uh, all three pieces together, right, suddenly you are become much more confident um, that the PDF is a, is a dream mansion, right? Um, you can also, uh, uh, obviously it's very hard to ask an expert to donate, uh, you know, hundreds of hours to annotate lots of example for you. But you could always sort of like buy them a lunch or, or coffee, right? And ask them to give you some top of mind uh, uh, regular uh, patterns about the domains, right? So, um, so we found, obviously- uh, Maybe about like a minute? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, maybe like a minute or left or a minute okay. or two? Okay. Um, I think I started like uh, 17 or something. Okay. Uh, don't worry. Yeah, we can go over a little bit. Okay, um, so um, anyway, so, so the, all the self-supervision, uh, what we could do is uh, obviously they are all noisy, right? So, um, and, but this is actually perfect for something like probabilistic logic to actually combine them in a coherent way. Uh, I wouldn't go into too much detail, but basically key idea is like imagining uh, the ZUI, right? Uh, those latent label decision, uh, 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 latent label that you wish you know, right? For example, Z1 could be whether the first PDF is a gene, Z2 is whether the second PDF is gene, and then the, the factor like F uh, would be saying uh, if they are co-referenced, right? They are probably should agree with each other, right? So essentially you can define a graphic model by incorporating those prior knowledge and they now define a joint probability distribution over the TIs, right? So from that, you can essentially just run state-of-the-art uh, probabilistic inference algorithm to compute a marginal and then treat them as uh, probabilistic labels. Right. So in this way, we basically develop a, a sort of a, a unifying framework for combining all those self supervision uh, called the probabilistic logic. Right. Um, I will sort of really just gloss away uh, some of the other slides uh, in the interest of time. Um, so we're one of the first to propose uh, using a graph neural network in NLP application. And the key idea is really trying to leveraging those uh, known uh, sort of like syntactic structure, for example, dependencies, right? Um, and in the, in the modern world of self attention, you can think about this is like you're using the syntactic structure to focus the uh, attention uh, to higher attentions, right? Um, and also for, you know, the, the document level relation extraction, we developed this uh, multi-scale representation learning. Essentially, you try to combine all those partial co-occurrences, um, try to model those sort of local, you know, uh, contextual representation and pull them into the document level representation um, to classify them. Um, so I'll skip a bunch of this results. Uh, suffice to say things uh, work really promising, right? Um, um, our most recent, uh, uh, one of our most recent focus is trying to uh, investigate uh, domain specific pre training, right? Um, a standard practice here is often you, st you, even when you care about, all you care about is biomedicine, you still start from general domain, right? So, but what we actually, uh, we actually sort of question the rationale behind this assumption and show that for domain uh, with abundant unlabeled text like biomedicine, uh, actually, there is not much reason to do that, right? So when we actually uh, pre-train the BIRD model from scratch uh, using PubMap alone, right, we actually was able to outperform uh, all the prior uh, BIRD model. Um, to facilitate this study, we also created a very comprehensive uh, biomedical uh, NLP benchmark that we hope to release uh, very soon. Um, so just very quickly touching on uh, some of the sort of exciting application uh, scenario. So we have made quite a bit of progress uh, in the molecular tumor board domain. Um, and um, one thing I want to emphasize is that we don't expect NLP or machine reading, um, despite all the hype about AI in health, right? We don't expect that at the current state, we can actually go all the way end to end, right? 
Um, what we actually uh, observe is that there is this really sweet spot uh, to do human computer symbiosis. So imagining all those 4,000 paper a day, right? That giant haystack, you want to find maybe 10 needles from it, right? Um, it's uh, very hard to go all the way to find precisely just those 10 needles, right? However, um, it's most of those haystacks actually doesn't even look remotely like the needle you're looking for. So even sort of like this kind of self-supervised machine reader can actually potentially weed out a lot of those kind of uh, uh, distraction and maybe present a human expert with like 20 candidate needles and then the human curator can actually very quickly uh, validate that, right? So suffice to say that uh, we've, uh, in, for example, one of the sort of uh, uh, collaboration, we actually uh, reach a pretty promising result. Um, these are people who actually are in cancer center and they are actually uh, try to manually curate this kind of knowledge. And we were now, uh, uh, there, there were very promising results to show that we can actually speed them up uh, substantially. Um, I want to just conclude by highlighting one really uh, exciting sort of like example sort of to show like why this kind of direction could be super impactful, right? So if you look at FDA, uh, they approve 50 drugs a, a year. Uh, that hasn't changed in the past uh, half a century, right? But the cost for an average uh, drug to develop an average approved drug really skyrocketed to billions of dollars, right? So this is uh, obviously unsustainable. And one of the big reasons for the cost is that we need to complete this kind of really large scale phase three trial, right? Uh, with thousands of patients in enrollment, right? And that costs a lot. Now, when in this kind of phase three trial, you basically compare uh, what happened when you apply the new drug versus what happened when you apply the standard of care. So from that, you can actually see an immediate opportunity, right? Because the standard of care are basically sort of like what's have been already practicing in the clinic. Uh, and that means that if you can harness the real world evidence from the EMR, you can potentially find those control without actually recruiting those patients, right? So this, this is no longer a pipe dream. Uh, people have shown that this can work. However, people right now rely purely on manual curation and that's, that's very hard to scale. And so, so but, but you can start to imagine how uh, getting uh, some of the machine reading on NLP to actually dramatically speed up uh, this kind of curation. So uh, I will end by uh, uh, thanking the team. Uh, these are the folks to actually do the work, right? Uh, I also want to uh, thank a lot of our collaborators over the years uh, who really inspire all this agenda and really without them, we can't really do anything of this.